Good afternoon, and welcome to the State of Security, the latest threats, defenses, and policy developments, a health system CIO Media Inc. production. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I'll be your moderator today. We got some interactive features that we're looking forward to bringing to you, our agree or over-the-top poll. The polling panel will automatically open when we launch that poll, and we hope you'll participate. And questions and comments, you can send those in at any time in the Q&A box and leave the default set to all panelists. And you could download the deck by using the URL on your screen, and it's at the bottom of our slides, and it's being sent out in the chat box. Lots of opportunities to get that. So just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to have our panel discussion featuring Sri Bharadwaj, Director of Applications and CISO and Acting Interim CIO with UC Irvine Health, Ron Merring, CISO with Texas Health Resources, and Anahi Santiago, CISO with Christiana Care Health System. And then we are going to have our Q&A. So without any further delay, let's jump right in to our main discussion. Um, Sri, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role there? Sri? Can you Sri, hear me you now? check if you got us? Yep, I can, my friend. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, UC Irvine Health is a uh, part of the UC system of uh, hospitals all across California, uh, UCLA, UCSF, UCSD, uh, UCI, UCR, and UC Davis. All of us uh, belong to the UC Health System, uh, one of the largest systems on the West Coast in terms of uh, catering for people in California. Uh, what UCI, what I do for UCI is a, I, I manage uh, our EMR and web apps and everything else associated with it, uh, plus also uh, is the CISO for the uh, UC Irvine Health System. UC Irvine Health is based in Orange, uh, California, uh, a friendly place to everybody, the happiest place <laughs> on earth. Uh, Disneyland <laughs> is where we are located, so we get to desire, uh, we get anybody who falls sick in Disneyland in our hospital. Uh, um, and uh, oh, we're probably uh, two minutes away from Disneyland, and uh, it, it's a it's a 450 bed hospital system, uh, multi specialty across the board, uh, over 80 to 100 locations, uh, all around the region, uh, and uh, more on the specialty side, known for our oncology and uh, GI practice. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today, Ron. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name's Ron Maring. Um, the intro was already done, so I serve um, as the CISO for Texas Health Resources. We're a, um, a mid to large healthcare delivery system located in uh, North Texas. We're based out of Arlington, Texas, right across from essentially Dallas Cowboys Stadium in Arlington. Um, and um, I've been here for hopefully about, uh, I guess about uh, a little bit over eight years, so I'm enjoying it. And uh, there you go. That's my that's that's Texas Health and who I am. Very good. Thank you, Ron. Anahi? Yeah, so I am the CISO at Christiana Care. Um, we just actually rebranded and dropped the health system from our name. Mm. Uh, so I forgot to tell you that. Uh, I'm <laughs> the lar largest healthcare system in the state of Delaware. Um, we are, um, in terms of admissions, I think 24th or 25th in the country. So pretty large. We're the only level one trauma um, hospital between Philadelphia and Maryland. So we play a pretty significant role. Um, we have um, various hospitals, freestanding um, emergency rooms, urgent care practices, you name it. So it integrated and complicated health system. And I oversee the, the information security program for the organization. Excellent. Very good. All right, let's go to our first question. I want to take this, you'll see, at two levels. So at the first level, I want to talk about generally the types of threats, and then for the next question, we can get into specific, any specific you know, viruses that are out there that we want to talk about that are a current threat or a recent threat or whatever. But let's talk in general. Um, as CISOs and security professionals, um, 
Do you have categories of threats? Um, uh, what are you currently facing right now? Ron, you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. So we, uh, we do, we carry a, um, a threat scenario catalog, um, and this documents at a, at a high level what our, our most common threats are, and then we kind of detail, detail that out into threat models. And I, I would just say I think we have all the traditional threats that all industries have. Um, I just think our surface area is a little bit different, so some of these threats can be a bit exacerbated because of the way we operate. But targeted phishing attacks, social engineering, uh, potentiality for third-party compromise, legacy system attacks, medical device attacks, zero-day attacks uh, based on uh, exposure, whether it's third-party or internet-based exposure, and, and we, of course, deal with uh, the subtleties of insider-based attacks. So I think that we, we kind of manage through uh, those, high, uh, th those kind of high-risk threat scenarios, and then we uh, deal with the traditional uh, threats every day. So that's kind of how we categorize that. Hopefully that answers the question a bit. Yeah, very good. Very good, Anahi. I think we're, uh, we're probably going to all give similar answers, right? Um, we are, um, you know, the, in addition to what was mentioned, right, we've got to contend with nation states that are looking to um, enter our network and access our data for, for various purposes. Um, you know, and healthcare continues to be the only industry where insider threat happens to be the biggest cause of breaches. So we are heavily focused on the, on the people factor of our cybersecurity program, as well as just overall availability. I mentioned that we're the only level one trauma center between Philadelphia and Maryland that, you know, it, unavailability of our systems could pose some significant risk to patient safety in, in this area. So um, we, we consider that to be one of our most significant threats. You mentioned insider threat, uh, is, and you said it's a higher level in healthcare. Is that because people in healthcare make more mistakes or there are more people trying to do nefarious things and you know, look into the celebrity record or that type of thing? Uh, so so uh, mostly mistakes um, in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in an industry where the pace is fast, the criticality of actions is significant. Um, our clinicians are more focused on responding to alerts than they are on logging out of systems or on really paying keen attention to what they're clicking on. So I really do believe most of it is mistakes. Um, but mm -hmm. you, you do, do have the uh, curious person that um, goes into medical records. You also have, you know, because we have so much access to data, um, you also have um, the risk of uh, folks being approached for monetary reasons to say, hey, you mm. know, give us Give us all of this data, oh. and we'll pay you X number of dollars. And depending you mean to on generate that, lawsuits, to generate lawsuits, that kind of thing. No, I mean, our, you know, we have social security numbers, we have insurance cards. Hmm. So the lure of somebody coming to one of our employees and saying, "You, yeah, we'll give you a thousand dollars if you get us a thousand records." Um, not that it happens often, but it's but it's a mm -hmm. real risk. Yeah. Uh, Sri, anything you want to add there? Yeah, sure. So, in fact, uh, congratulations to the CISOs. This is, happens to be the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, October is the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month for all of us uh, nationally. Uh, me, as a, a representative of the Executive Committee for Health and uh, Health Sector Council, uh, I consider this event uh, one of those uh, events that actually helps uh, the na nation uh, with more cybersecurity knowledge and impacting the awareness that we need to bring to cybersecurity. So, uh, Anthony, thank you for putting this together on, uh, on in October, uh, which really is is a is a phenomenal uh, kind of a bridge into what we need to do around uh, education and awareness. Um, and I think uh, uh, I will start with that. And then adding to the threats, I mean, we from our perspective, uh, we do a lot of research work and. Uh, uh, our data uh, is, is pretty valuable from that perspective. Every day we get a request for research, for uh, data for research, and uh, we, are, we have to be extremely careful uh, to manage and maintain the trust of our patients. So for us, uh, that is a huge factor uh, that we continue to 
uh, worry about on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, while at the same time we've got all these controls in place, including an IRB and everything else, uh, still there are you know a lot of people wanting to do a lot of work around uh, trying to use the data to uh, provide some feedback back to the um, either the pharmacies, the pharmaceutical companies, or to to uh, other re other reasons for for research purposes. That's one threat that we continue to face. And uh, the other thing that we ob obviously do is the advent of uh, uh, IoT in the environment. Uh, we have patients nowadays mm -hmm. uh, bringing in their Alexas, their uh, you know personal devices into the hospital beds, and uh, I, I, we had a story uh, uh, quite a while ago where uh, a patient's daughter wanted to uh, Facebook her friend's father, who happens to be another consulting physician. Uh, down the spot, right? So we gotta we gotta be careful about those things too, because that's what's going to hit uh, hit us in the future. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, in interesting times to be a CISO. The job is getting more and more complex and difficult, but that means you're more and more in demand. So I guess it's a double-edged sword. Good job security. Um, all right, let's go to our next question, and um, I thought this would be interesting, so we'll see how it goes with the answers, but can we take it now down to a more specific level, and is there anything you want to talk about in terms of specific current threats that are, I don't know, if you want to go top three or top one, um, just any other way of taking it down to a more specific level of, uh, and again, are there specific things for healthcare organizations or are these specific threats for every organization? So take that any way you want to. Anahi, why don't you go first? Uh, you know, uh, ransomware continues to be the biggest problem, um, not specifically for healthcare. Um, in fact, I think municipalities and cities are becoming a, almost a bigger target at this, at this point in time, but it's still a very real threat that organizations have to deal with on a regular basis. And um, the, the ransomware variants specifically are getting very sophisticated and they're mutating. And, you know, I read a, I read a recent article um, that spoke to, you know, CISOs should stop thinking that they're combating the bad guys. Um, they should start thinking that they're combating a community of bad guys. And I thought mm, it was a really that's interesting. interesting perspective. Um, and I think it's very spot on. The um, the bad actor community really collaborates. The, the darknet has vast resources that can be utilized by somebody that isn't even particularly skilled in information security. You know, there's ransomware for hire, um, they have help desks, um, that you can pay a maintenance cost. I mean, this is, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and us as CISOs with limited resources have some serious challenges in being able to combat um, and so specifically, the, the threat of ransomware to me is still very, very real. In addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, right, our, our employees are daisy caring for patients. They don't have the time to stop and think and scrutinize a particular email or potentially stop from clicking on a link and providing credentials. And so um, education uh, or our, our ability to educate um, continues to be a, a huge tool in our arsenal in order to be able to combat this. And then there's, you know, all of the data that we have and data exfiltration are still, you know, top of mind. Right, right. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, Sri, comments? Um, I, I think and I covered this uh, excellently. Well, uh, I'll just add that, you know, there are times when, especially uh, next couple of months, is when fishing is going to be on the rise. Uh, you know, festival times, Christmas times, we've seen it all the time. There is people wanting to buy stuff online come Black Friday. You got so much of these fishing going on uh, that really, really is, is going to help. Uh, you know, we, we have to help our, our employees and also our patients in a way uh, not get uh, succumbed to these kind of uh, uh, attacks purely because if, if you know, if, if, if our employees are happy, they treat our patients well. If our patients are happier, uh, they have a much better experience coming into the hospital and out, right? So uh, when you mm -hmm. look at the community that we support, that's what we look for. Uh, the second thing uh, from our perspective is to also make sure we've got uh, the right level of uh, knowledge about how to use application systems, how to use their computers, how to do basic stuff. Uh, a lot of people... 
uh, you know, learn by rote in the sense they, they figure it out, right? So, and when they figure it out, they do things that they probably would not be would would not be doing if they were kind of forewarned, right? So, mm-hmm. we we believe in forewarning, education, awareness a lot more than you know uh, penalizing the guy who was fished three times out and. Uh, you know, a slap on the face because the guy was like, you know, he took my fishing course and he still failed three times when I fished him, right? So, and it, uh, don't don't get me wrong, it's not the average, uh, uh, it's not the janitor or it's not the average staff. It's some of our C-suite folks as well. Uh, I mean, I've, right. I've heard this from other CISOs who have had C-suite folks click on the same link three times over. I'm like, hey, you know, guys, you guys got trained every year and you still go click the thing. Well, it said that I should pay the CFO, you know, some money. I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't help you, right? So we got this um, crazy conversations about stuff, but that's our reality. I mean, that's that's the that's our situation. So uh, we, we, of course, ransomware, you know, malware, uh, phishing, all of these are fairly well known, well proven as attacks, and we've got tools, technologies you can deploy. But the essence is people. At the end of the day, if the person is not going to heed to any of these training or awareness or stuff that you put out, and he's still going to be that person that really is going to be the fortress that you are building, right? So you are as strong as the weakest link. And the weakest link are people who get succumbed to some sort of a attack unknowingly, almost all the time, unknowingly. But the best part is when they do something unknowingly, we just tell them, guys, don't worry about it. Let us know immediately so we can help you help yourself. That is a big piece that we talk to people because they cannot, any human being cannot know all threats, cannot know everything that is going to impact them. But if and when they believe that they're impacted, let us know so we can help you navigate through the mess that you might be in. Maybe, may not be, but at least give you that, what I call uh, the patient's sense of comfort, that you're okay. Yes, you're fine. Or here's an antidote. Go take this antibiotic and you'll be fine. Right, that's what we tell our employees, our patients too. Okay, very good. All right, Ron, let's start with you on this one. Um, Anahi seemed to indicate it was. Uh, is ransomware on the rise? Is it the issue? Um, and also, I was wondering, um, there's not quote unquote ransomware, right? As far as the CIO is, a CISO is concerned, is ransomware ransomware or is there ransomware a class and then there's all different types? So you don't defeat ransomware, you defeat particular uh, strands of ransomware, as it were. Um, and are healthcare companies more vulnerable to this type of attack? Your thoughts? Uh, well, to answer the last part of that, I think ransomware is ransomware. In other words, that what what's in, what its intent is, is to let's say encrypt data at rest and then obviously hold it for ransom. Now, the vectors of that attack and how it how it inserts itself into the network changes, and that's um, it. And there's a, a few different ways it could happen. It could be taking you know, obviously taking advantage of a weakness in a system, or just the inherent way the system works. So we've seen kind of a few different ways. And so there are, I would say, different strands and vectors and how those things kind of insert themselves into the infrastructure, into the network. So I would say yes. But the end result is kind of the same, right? Their intent is to encrypt and then hold it for ransom. Now, mm-hmm. from my perspective, is is it on the rise? I'm, I'm not so sure it's on the rise. Um, I think it's a steady state and evolving, I would agree that it's evolving, I mean, uh, and as long as ransomware can be monetized, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll place the investment back into evolving uh, the ransomware approach, whether it's, whether it's a hosting, ransomware hosting service <laughs> where people are piling in there and crowdsourcing and doing everything in the ransomware kind of as a service or they're doing independently through yeah. independent social engineering attacks. So I don't know if it's, I think it's the same to be very honest. Now, I would say just to, add on to what was already said, a healthcare delivery system is highly dependent on its partnerships and its third-party providers. 
and we see more critical business and clinical workflows going to these third-party providers. And when they're impacted, and they might have um, not nearly the size of investment that a large healthcare system might have. So here you've inserted a clinical workflow into, let's say, um, a radiologist group or some other type of group, it doesn't matter, that might not have the same posture, and then they, let's say, they, are, they succumb to a ransomware attack, and now that is inserted, that, that problem statement is inserted back into the healthcare delivery system, and now we've got to respond to that through adjusting the way we operate. So uh, basically, the uh, we have to figure out a way to um, raise the, um, the the water the water line for everyone, so that those that interconnect or provide services to the healthcare delivery system have commensurate controls, especially on what I would consider ransomware is a fairly common based attack, and we should be working with them on these very common attacks on how they can do better on and as far as how they can help themselves and and protecting themselves so they can deliver services to us. So, it, 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 like I said, healthcare delivery systems are, have a high, a lots of integration with lots of partners, and it can be extremely disruptive when they're compromised. And we've seen that happen often now in the industry, where third parties are, are compromised, and, that's, and, and then that's effect, affecting the performance of the healthcare delivery system. So that's where I would go as far as my comments on the prevalence and um, impact. Hopefully that answers it. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Uh, Anahi, anything you want to add to that? Uh, I, I, I think that was spot on. I think the, you know, in terms of the industry, I think one of the challenges that's unique to us are those medical devices, which are really just mm. computers. Um, because yeah. although we can patch to our cycles um, for everything else, um, with medical devices, we, we have to wait on the vendors to go through their testing cycles before we can apply those patches, that, um, thereby leaving critical systems that are used to care for patients vulnerable for prolonged periods of time. Very good. All right. Thank you. All right, Sri, let's go with you on this one. What is your advice in regards to preparing against and dealing with the ransomware attack? You know, this is different, right? This is a different type of uh, entity out there, and I would imagine preparation and response have to be quite different. Um, and we do hear of organizations paying the ransom, which I would imagine is kind of frustrating to everyone else, but, you know, walk a mile in my shoes, so to speak, right? We don't know until we're there in the same position. Um, you know, these are all smart people, uh, theoretically, that are making that decision. So uh, on, on the surface, it may not seem wise overall. It may be, I guess, necess necessary for them. So your thoughts on those issues? Uh I think a, a strong structured incident response plan uh, is, a, is a minimum requirement uh, in today's environment, uh, particularly because of the uh, nature of threats we have. And uh, I think uh, doing a tabletop exercise, uh, understanding uh, how you can be prepared, uh, let's face it, everybody gets hit, everybody gets attacked. Some of us, some of us realize it, some of us don't. Um, and I think uh, that is going to be the norm uh, going forward. So how do, we, how do we put in technologies in place that helps us, uh, guards us in a way? Uh, we are great at perimeter security, meaning, uh, you know, uh, attack from the outside, uh, what we call north-south north attacks. Uh, but the minute the intruder gets into the environment, the east-west is where we have a a big uh, difficulty situation today, not just in healthcare, but in other industries too. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the question around, uh, uh, you know, sharing this information is important as well with other uh, re uh, regulatory agencies, including legal folks. So I have friends with the FBI uh, who we have a relationship with, who we bring in when we see, you know, something like this. That's an important factor too. Uh, because that helps you uh, kind of, you know, once they take over in a way, uh, then it, 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 it helps you to deal with your leadership in, in one form while you have uh, the FBI being your friends in making this work mm -hmm. for you. Uh, that's, a, that's a big so, deal that uh, we put together. Yeah. Establishing those relationships beforehand, uh, does, you know, in your opinion, do most CISOs have that relationship with the FBI beforehand, or is that something they really need to do and maybe they aren't? 
Uh, some of them do, and some of them begin to realize that they need to have those relationships. Uh, I mean, in Los Angeles, through InfraGuard, uh, we are all connected in a way, shape, or form. Uh, what I have done to help uh, build that, uh, what we call knowledge sharing, is uh, have the FBI come and speak at one of our events. So uh, then mm -hmm. the, the local you know, agency representative will be able to kind of showcase how they can help uh, in case there is a, a, an attack. And the other thing is that uh, we also um, have relationship with uh, attorneys, law firms uh, that you know specialize in or or, right. or can put that thing together. Uh, the third most important thing is marketing communication. Our relationship with them in terms of how you put out information, uh, what information mm -hmm. that they can actually you can share and what you cannot share uh, is an important factor too. And, you know, almost all of this stuff could go into ACP, attorney-client privilege, right? So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you, ahead of time, you know, share stuff so that you know uh, you have some way to, to feed that information out to the broader population? Uh, you know, you, you can be, you know, uh, forthright in a way, right? I mean, hey, look, we know, we are evaluating, we are reviewing, we are investigating. It's a perfect statement. You don't need to say mm -hmm. we got the we got the intruder. We we are going to pay for the ransom. It, that 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 puts you <laughs> in a different kind of situation, right? Uh, yeah. Anthony is telling me I need to pay him ten bucks because he's got my hard drive. Well, you know you don't want to say that, right? You can you can you can you can say yeah you are in the recovery mode. You can you can do a lot of things and you can manage that uh, in a way uh, as well. So um, it's it, it's about preparing ahead of time. Preparing your leadership. Your leadership should not freak out, right? Oh, my God, we got hit by a ransomware attack. I don't know what to do. You know, prepare your leadership. Let's get them acclaimed away. You might get hit, so don't freak out, right? And, and talk to marketing folks and say, marketing, I might lean on you sometimes because this might be happening in the back end. And that, that's the kind of thing that I think CISO should be looking for, to, to protect themselves with relationships around them that when they hit, they are not just bogged down with, oh, my God, what do I do next? And you have a playbook, mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm. can have the playbook, and that really helps. And Ahi, what are your thoughts on, on uh, those relationships? You know, Sri mentioned you've got a number of different relationships that the CISO would want to establish before an incident, the FBI um, for that external help, but then you've also got, as he mentioned, marketing. So something like ransomware goes down, uh, the CISO is going to want to be working with marketing to get the right messaging out. Uh, and then you have all these other dynamics around ransomware, which are a little different than a traditional attack. I would imagine a traditional attack, the CISOs really can function uh, as the leader of, of resolving it if it's mostly an IT issue. But we, ransomware it involves much more than that, right? It involves big decisions that are probably – uh, no offense to anyone, but above the pay grade of CISOs, right? I mean, that's a CEO decision. That's a board decision. Are we making a payment? How much is it? What you know? They're asking you, how 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 much can you guarantee me we're going to get this stuff back if we pay, right? So it's it's just a much broader, bigger problem that elevates the CISO even more into this major decision matrix. And again, those relationships established beforehand sound like they're, they're critical to not start from scratch. So your thoughts are on all that, and then we'll bring you in, Ron. Uh, so, so I agree with you with the magnitude of this issue. One of the things that I did when I first got here was to look at our incident response plan and integrate it with the hospital incident command system, the HICS model, right? The healthcare industry has had an incident response framework for decades. Um, and there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. There's a hospital command structure with a commander that has ties into finance, into legal, into um, clinical work. Um, and so I, I think as healthcare systems, we should be leveraging that model as opposed to rewriting the scripts. Um, but in terms of relationships, it's really important to have those relationships ahead of time. You want to build that, that credibility, that camaraderie, that mm -hmm. trust, mm -hmm. so that when you go to leadership um, with a major issue such as ransomware, um, you're not having to invent the lingo. They understand what we're talking about. They understand the implications. They understand the role, right? Who's going to make the right. decision about payment? 
who's going to pick up the phone and call the board um, to have those conversations? Um, how, if we decide we're going to pay, how are we going to um, create that Bitcoin account? Um, where does right. money, um, we, you know, we, we should all be having those conversations, but at you know, right. what point are we going to call our cyber liability insurance carrier? Do we mm -hmm. have an right. response retainer firm that we can call right away to be our partner and help us to not only contain, but to really respond end to end? Um, the third party lawyers, um, do we know who they are? Um, have we yeah. contacted with them? Have we had the dialogues? And so it, it's really important that as CISO, we build really strong relationships. I forgot to even mention privacy, shame on me. Um, they, they have to be alongside of us. Um, and so I, I would say that a, a really strong incident response program is integrated with that Hicks model and uh, ties back to a very um, evolved communication plan so that even from a communication perspective, our marketing and external affairs folks know, um, have pre can messages already, know how they're going to communicate not only to the media and to our senior leadership, but to our clinicians. They're, the, they're at the front line. They're the ones getting the questions about what is happening, right? When, um, I don't wanna pick on anybody, but when a hospital in DC was hit with ransomware, um, their message was, we're, we're, it's not ransomware. Um, and the Washington Post was in one of the hospitals talking to a, a staff member who was pointing at a computer saying, yeah, look, it is. Uh, we've, got ahead of, we've got to get ahead of that, right? Um, because mm -hmm. not only responding to the, to the actual incident, but also responding to how we're viewed as, um, as clinicians, as a, as a reputable healthcare system, as a, as a member of the community. Um, so that messaging is, is really important and getting ahead of it is critical. Ron, anything you want to add on, on that whole bowl of wax there? No, I, I would just end up repeating everything that they said. They, it was all wonderfully detailed and I would just say we do all the same things. I would, the only thing I would just add is, and because the importance of having a plan is, what is it that Mike Tyson said? He said everybody has a plan uh -huh. and punched in the mouth. <laughs> Yep. Um, and I would just say that <laughs> it, it really necessitates really deep, well thought out, um, practical exercising that addresses both um, the issues around uh, maintaining the privacy of our patients and consumers, as well as, and probably even more importantly, a, by the way, more importantly, the safety of our caregivers and patients while they're while they're in our hospitals. So all those things need to be brought together. And, and in a healthcare delivery system, those are different constituencies that need to be brought to brought around those problem statements. And in many cases, don't necessarily have the same incentives when in the response cycle. In other words, and how quick to move and what the details need to be gathered and how and the pacing and rhythm of things. So your your privacy department might not have the same perspectives and rhythm as uh, your safety professionals working at the hospital. So uh, when you have a ransomware attack, which is basically bounding multiple areas in your enterprise, you have to bring mm -hmm. different people to bear on that problem and, and practice it. So that's the only thing I would add. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another one, Ron, because uh, they took most of the answer there. So uh, it, is it a good idea to bring in outside consultants for penetration testing, white hat, sort of testing your systems, all these things? Is that something a health system can do itself, or is it really important to bring in uh, outside consultants to, to get a true test? Uh, we, I can say at Texas Health, we've sourced it for years. We bring in outside consultants to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, number one, it's a skills issue and a maintenance of skills and staffing and things like that come, into bear, come to bear around um, trying to maintain, let's say, a, a penetration test team or, a, you know, that type of team. There's, it's kind of hard to maintain. We found it easier to, to source that, and so we have a firm that's helped mm -hmm. us for many years um, do this. Now, I can tell you this. Um, this entire space around penetration testing is evolving, and we just went live on a continuous testing product to basically automate uh, the penetration testing, and this is the new way to go. Um, penetration testers might come in twice a year or on a very targeted way. You might have a specific set of exposures or potential exposures or threat scenarios you want them to evaluate. 
you might be doing purple team exercising, but you might have something very specific for them to do. But the commodity-based testing, we're working very, and we just went live, we're automating it all. We're taking the MITRE ATT&CK framework, we're automating it, and we're going to do continuous testing now where we're going to continually evaluate our controls, if not uh, on a much quicker pace, anywhere from every minute to every couple of weeks to 30 days. It all depends on the type of control, but that's where all this is going. It's fully automating that practice and injecting it right into operations for solutioning. Don't keep it a distance away, a degree of separation from operations. Make it a part of operations in the solutioning because most of our problems when, when we do a root cause analysis around breaches, I wouldn't say most, well, many, is control failure itself. In other words, there was a change and something wasn't turned back on or just the control itself has evolved and stopped maybe detecting or preventing something. We've seen that in many cases around um, these, these security breaches. So we said, let's take a quality-based approach. Let's do continuous testing. That is, the, where this, that is the next evolution. And so pen testing is great, bring in an outside firm. They'll always be there with us, but we want to focus them on really difficult problems and not the commodity testing. So hopefully that answers your question. Excellent. Very good. All right, I'm going to go to what I consider to be a couple of fun and interesting questions here. Um, and three, I'm going to go with you first. Uh, what does it take to be a superior healthcare IT security professional? So, um, what kind of person is not suited for the job you folks do? What does it take to be good at this job? I think it's a very unique job, so I thought that might elicit some interesting answers. It's a, it's no doubt a unique job. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for people to get trained into this position, into this profession. Uh, oh, we've done some work in that area uh, in the past. I think uh, the other uh, thing that it, it really takes is um, attention uh, to the level of detail you need to make sure you've got the right people, uh, the right level mm -hmm. of engagement both with the C-suite as well as with the staff, uh, somebody who is uh, not afraid to uh, innovate, uh, not afraid to um, initiate new conversations because that's what you need to do when uh, the threats keep changing, right? It's not the same, mm -hmm. same old, same old kind of deal. Every day it's a new day uh, from a threat perspective. And uh, last but not the least, um, you need some pretty good leadership qualities uh, in terms of uh, moving things around and, and uh, working with people and getting uh, getting your point across and uh, uh, from a communication perspective. That was what takes to be today's uh, healthcare IT security professional. Uh, in the olden days, uh, you could uh, stay in the basement and uh, hack away and uh, <laughs> be fine, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it was, it was uh, hey, you know, Where's your security guy? Oh, he's down in the basement, uh, you know, uh, checking out the servers and uh, doing penetration attacks, right? I mean, that's no longer going to be your security professional anymore uh, because now you're in the limelight, especially after what's going on. Um, you get a position in the board. And uh, in some respects, I mean, like when I presented to the Executive Compliance Committee last week, uh, it was a conversation. It's no longer a I'm just presenting and walking away. They are like, okay, Sri, what do you think we should be doing to manage this risk? That is the level of conversation you're getting. And that conversation is what we need to be ready for. And that's not going to be the guy who uh, went through the books and read how to encrypt data and got his CISSP sitting in some hole somewhere. But really, you know, somebody who understands the knowledge, understands the healthcare space, who's willing to sit down and have a conversation with that tough physician who says, I don't really care for your stupid password, um, you know, uh, the 16-character password you want, right? So it's a very different dynamic individual that you're talking today. Very good. Excellent. Um, Anahi, let's go with you on this one. How can a security professional defend their competence after a breach? I call that the CYA question. So when it all goes bad, listen, here's what everyone says. We're being attacked all the time, whether we know it or not. There's breaches all the time. 
So you're still going to have CISOs. You can't fire everybody. So how do you put yourself in a position, if something happens, to be able to demonstrate that you did a good job? So that's a great question. Um, and, you know, we talked about relationships, um, and I referenced building trust and confidence in, in the role and in the team. And so I'll take that a bit further. In constant transparency and communication around the existing threat landscape, um, the current risk landscape within the organization, risk tolerance, culture, um, the having the conversation in terms of, you know, my role isn't to accept risk, it's to communicate it. And collectively as an organization, we make informed decisions about how we're going to manage risk, whether it's accepting it, mitigating right. it, transferring it. And, um, and so uh, as senior leaders, um, empowering them to make decisions about how we're going to move forward and after a breach, reminding them of what decisions were made, <laughs> why they were made, right? I like that, yeah. But, but really, making sure that we're having those continuous conversations at the board level with senior leadership so that when something happens, we can go back and revisit collective decisions that were made. Um, and I believe that if, if we do that well, then we're not in a position where we have to defend ourselves because we've been having that right. common dialogue um, and there's a sense collectively that security is everybody's role and I'm, my role is really to inform and help to move the needle forward, but I'm not the sole decision maker. So if we can be effective in doing that, then, I, then I'm more, much more comfortable that we're not going to have to go on the defensive when something bad happens. I like that. Very good. All right. Now we are going to have our agree or over the top poll. So uh, there's three points here. And if you are audience, if you can answer these and just check off what you think about these statements, do you agree with them or are they over the top? Every health systems network is currently being hacked or compromised in some way, though they may not know it. Uh, Ron, let me get your reaction to the statement. First, do you agree with that or is that over the top? Um, <laughs> um, I think you got to pick. I think it's over the. I think it's over the top. Okay, so tell me why. Is this just an exaggeration? It's it's not happening yeah, to everyone. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, only because I mean, when we just kind of all generalizations are false, right? And that's a generalization, right? To, to say that <laughs> every 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 um, healthcare delivery system should be um, is compromised in some way. I think number one is a definition of compromise. What exactly is that? Um, there are attacks every day and different levels of attacks and things like that. But generally speaking, is all the data leaking out of a, every organization, or should they expect that? Number one, I think operating in a in a in a breach state. In other words, it's not wrong um, to think that hey, I should operate in a continuous breach state. I also think mm -hmm. if you do that, it's exhausting for teams. Because what you do is you end okay. up diminishing your program by saying, I'm always breached. At some point, you made investment in protective technologies, detective technologies, and response uh, processes. And um, you have to be able to say that these things are working at some level, um, at least at the 95th percent level, and then deal with the 5 percent that is the last mile. So, and that's the way I like to approach these things and say, look, we have coverage, we have confidence and coverage at the 95th at 95 percent. We deal with the five percent every day. That's kind of the way I would do that. That's the reason why it's over the top for me. Hopefully, that makes sense. Awesome, great answer, great answer. All right, Sri, let's go with you for the next one. Making a ransomware payment is never okay. Agree or over the top? This is not a decision that you make as, as an individual person. You make this kind of decision. With, with You're punting. Together. You're punting. No, you, no, no. You've I mean, got it just I, I, for I, fun. No, I'm, I'm telling you. See, making a ransomware payment okay. is never okay. I mean, why would I always agree to pay if every thief was out there saying in my house and say, give me your gold, I'm going to walk away, and I'll be stolen every day, right? So there's no point in saying you're going to get every time when a thief walks in the door and you, got, you, you pay up, it, it becomes more rampant. So what you need right. to do is to say, you know, of course, you cannot reason out with the guys, obviously, uh, because that's not what you do. Uh, but you take precautions to make sure that you never have to have that discussion ever. 
that's where you you become more uh, you know uh, you become more fortified in, in in helping making that decision a very rational decision. Uh, your this this question is sometimes could be irrational in terms of well I got to pay let's go pay it and hopefully I'll get my data back right. That's what's going to be the conversation. No, your answer is is fine, and I'm okay with it. And it actually relates to a question I had before that I didn't ask. I have it written down, but I didn't ask it for time purposes, which was how do CISOs who want to be active like yourself right now, like all three of you online, you want to be out there, you want to be helpful, you want to be educating your peers and helpful, but yet – there is an element of opening yourself up, perhaps, if you say certain things when you're discussing security, maybe if you're too specific about what you're facing and your vulnerabilities. So is that really all it is when you're out there talking about security? You're not talking about my personal health system has these three weaknesses, right? I mean, I don't know if hackers go on our webinars, right? <laughs> or they check them out online. You know, listen, if you're a hacker, maybe that's something you do in your spare time. You listen to security webinars and go to conferences. But your thoughts there? So uh, we never talk specifics, obviously. Uh, it right. doesn't make any sense. Right. Uh, because that, that threat that you had this morning is not the same threat that you're going to have two hours down the line, right? Because I could right. have a patch. The patch is already deployed. I don't have that threat right now. I have, a, I have three devices that have got threats in them. That's like a point in time, which makes doesn't make any sense. Uh, and that's my mm -hmm. conversation with the C-suite as well, right? I mean, we, we're never going to ever say I'm always protected. We're never going to ever say I'm never protected either. So there is going to be that that fluency between the two. It's always going to be there. What I think is that, I mean, you're, you're asking a question that, you know, is the payment is okay or not okay? I mean, when I look at it, it's an ethical question, right? Should I make the payment or not from an ethical perspective? It, it, there's a lot of other factors that we need to look right. into this conversation. Yeah, no doubt. Right. No, no, it's it's good. Very good answer. There's a, there's a lot there, so I certainly understand. Um, last one. Uh, the bad guys will always be one step ahead of the good guys. Anahi? I think that's over the top, um, although I think some days I feel like they are. Um, <laughs> I also think, um, so, so a couple of thoughts on this. One is that, um, you know, going back to the comment I made around CISOs versus the community, not just a single bad guy, um, I, I think that the converse is also happening where the healthcare cybersecurity community is starting to share and collaborate a lot more than it did 5, 10, 15 years ago when I started. Um, and so that's going to help move the needle forward as we continue to collaborate, share, help each other out. Great example is the potential um, exceptions for the Spark Law um, on cybersecurity. Boy, if we could mm -hmm. actually be, help our smaller providers um, in the community to elevate their their cybersecurity posture, we all win. I'm also really optimistic in that some of the challenges that we face is around the manufacturers, whether it's Microsoft or a medical device, and right. being responsible about implementing security as part of the core components of the system as opposed to bolting it on. And I do believe that as the industry in general and the tech industry matures, we're going to start to see cybersecurity controls embedded into the products that we're buying as opposed to being bolted mm -hmm. on after the fact. So I think that between the industry collaboration, maturity, and, and the system lifecycle development will also make it harder for the bad guys to move as quickly as they have traditionally been able to do. All right, very good. I'm going to share the poll results, and we will look at those quickly. Um, every health system network is currently being hacked or compromised in some way. 54% agree with me, so, so there. Okay, so 50 put, and I'm not with me with the statement, although I do feel vindicated. Um, making a ransomware payment is never okay. 62% say that is over the top. So the majority of people think it, there are cases where it's okay to pay a ransomware. Um, 
and the bad guys will always be one step ahead. 85% say that's over the top. So there's a lot of optimism there and positivity. I just want to um, get to one more question, get uh, Ron to weigh in on one more question. And it's very comical to me. It's the security question that everyone gets asked. What keeps you up at night, right? I mean, how many things are named what keeps you up at night, security-focused stuff. It's the security, the classic security question. So, Ron, um, other than anything personal, what keeps you up at night? Um, that's such a big question, too. <laughs> uh, the, I would just say, I, said, I think nothing keeps me up at night. We have great teams, so I sleep really well. But I think the things that are the most concerned to me is the, um, just the management of legacy and other, um, let's say, medical devices, IoT, mm -hmm. the really the yep. building control systems in hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's the integration of these, what we would call kind of not the, the health IT assets, it's everything outside of that and how they're integrated in managing the risk across the enterprise, and not in silos, but across the enterprise in a very integrated way because these are all, these all become interdependent risks and threats and things like that. So. I think that's what keeps me up the most around um, security. And Ron, real quick, internet, it, the IOMT, much larger than medical devices. Is that it's a bigger scope we're talking about? Because that's everything, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 it's everything that's, from an elevator in a health system. It's everything from an elevator control system to physical security cameras mm -hmm. to to the to the uh, the video screens in the lobbies to parking to <laughs> it's all this stuff is yeah. very tightly integrated in a healthcare delivery system it's complex to engineer security around so and there's a lot of different vectors there so it's it's tough all right well that was absolutely amazing conversation um and it's about all we had time for today uh, regarding continuing education, those of you who hold the CHIME CHCIO certification get one CEU for attending our webinars. So let CHIME know you were here, and if you've asked us to do so, we will certainly let them know. If you need a certificate of attendance for another CEU program, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll receive an email as soon as the on-demand recording of this event is posted to our website. And if you'd like to sponsor one of our upcoming events or book a custom event, you could reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can go to our site to register for any of our upcoming webinars. So with that, I want to thank our panel, Sri Baradwaj, Ron Merring, and Anahi Santiago, a wonderful panel. And I want to thank our attendees for joining us as usual. So with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.